Hey folks, welcome to Yokohama, Japan. I'm Mark from Sea Wild Earth. And tonight I'm going to be showing you how I shoot urban time lapse going from the daylight that we've got now to a nocturnal setting using the Genie Mini from SOAP at an intersection that's not too far away from here. I'm going to be using a Canon 5D Mark III. I've got no straps on it. Even in the urban environment, there is wind, there's vibration on that strap. And I don't want to use that on a time lapse because it may be too fragile. In conjunction with a Canon 5D Mark III, I'm going to be using my favorite wide lens. It's the Nikon 14-24mm f2.8 DEG. I need to have, and I do have here, a no reflex adapter where my aperture control is just this little blue lever that you can see here. Now this brings us on to our first point is the location. What we want to try and do is to get the effect where we've got a two and a half second shutter so we get that nice streaming effect of headlights. At street level, I don't know if you're going to be able to get that. You're going to get traffic stopping here, you're going to get traffic stopping there. Even though our interval is going to make all of that gel together, I think the true dynamic comes from when you've got many different directions all moving together. But what I have noticed in this location, there's an elevated place and I think it's probably going to be pretty cool to shoot from up there. It's going to allow us the freedom to shoot a really nice wide open scene and get this whole dynamic of this crossroads here. I've got my tripod set up already. Just going to grab the Serp Genie Mini. That then is just going to screw directly onto my tripod. I've got my ball head. That goes on here. Let's get the camera sorted out. I'm on F8. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set my white balance. At the moment you'll see I'm on cloud white balance. I don't want to have a default setting on it. I'm going to go into my white balance. I'm going to select that and I'm going to scroll through to Kelvin. And you'll see that Kelvin at the moment is giving me a characteristic of 5300. That is a daylight setting and that generally tends to be a little bit too warm for nighttime. In the higher numbers of your Kelvin is a warmer colour, more orangey yellow. If you go down to a lower numerical factor, you're going to get a colder, bluer colour. And the reason that I do that is because I want to try and override the overbearing yellow and orange tinge that you get from neon, street lights, etc. at night time. And so just to reduce that, I'm going to come down to a Kelvin of 3300. That I found over a period of time generally tends to be the best Kelvin for urban time lapse. I'm going to now set focus. The way that I do that is I'll go into live view. I can choose an area of high contrast, go into expanded focus on the Canon, and I'll use the zebra of the crossing and the cars to set my focus. Once I'm set and I'm happy, I then come out of live view and that's my focus done. Next thing I'm going to format my card just so I know that I've got a nice clean card to start with. You'll notice that I'm shooting raw. This way for the editing I've got more leeway. Next thing is ISO. At the moment it's showing 400. I want to be lower than that. I'm going to come down to 100. Bearing in mind that I've got small aperture with ISO 100 which means my shutter speed is going to be slow at the beginning and I'm targeting to get a shutter speed of around 2.5 seconds in order to get that really nice streaky effect. I think we're good to go. Now that the camera's set up, I'm going to turn the Genie on, fire up the app. The first thing I need to do is I need to pair the Genie with my iPhone. On the connect in the top right hand corner you get this little circle, by clicking that it's going to search for the Genie Mini, it's got that, you've got the green tick, you press OK. You have then a selection, new time lapse or a preset, I'm going to go new time lapse, top left hand corner record time, this is the amount of time that you're on site, if I'm going to shoot for 40 minutes, that's what I want to put in the record time. Play time is the amount of physical time that sequence is going to play on screen. If it's going to run for 12 seconds, 15 or 18 seconds, that will be shown in your playtime. The interval, quite simply, is the interval between your shots. Now, when you plan an interval, you have to think about how your time lapse is going to run. 
I want to hit a maximum shutter speed of about two and a half seconds. And the reason is because I want to have that very nice blurred line effect with the lights of the cars just to create that passage of time sensation of a time lapse. Five seconds is enough, it allows me to have a two and a half second shutter, it allows the data to be written to the card and it then prepares the camera for the next shot. So I like to round the interval at five seconds. What I can then do is set my motion. Let's go into live view. You can see the view of my camera is right now. If I drag, you can see I'm going to set my start point and my start point is going to be somewhere like that. I'm happy with that. What we can do now is we can just press play and this is going to give me now a real time view of the motion that I'm going to get throughout the sequence of this time lapse. If at this time I find that my planned travel is too little which I believe it is, I can go into there and I can increase or decrease it as I wish. I just added another six degrees and I'm happy with that. I'm happy with the start point, I'm happy with the end point. That's gonna be my time lapse. So all I need to do now is record. There's my first frame. And so now I'm just gonna wait for the time lapse to run its course. And during that time, I'm gonna manually ramp through shutter speed and ISO to maintain exposure throughout the time lapse. As you can see now, I've got the problem where I need to crank up my shutter speed because I'm dropping down the metering showing me that I'm underexposed. What I have to do is I have to coordinate that time with when I'm shooting. There we go, I cranked it up to two seconds. It's still showing me that I'm under. Wait for another shot or two to take when you're comfortable. Go. now we're on two and a half seconds you can see that we're still a little bit underexposed so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to manually ramp the ISO and again I have to coordinate that with the time when I'm not shooting and now we're on 320 and then throughout the duration of the time lapse I just monitor that and make sure that I maintain the metering on the camera Okay, so for editing, I've come back from my time-lapse shoot. I'm going to use Adobe Lightroom and LR Time-lapse Pro for editing. Here on the left-hand side, I have my root directory. I've selected the folder that contains all of the images from the shoot, the 720 frames that I shot for this time-lapse. Now, what LR Time-lapse allows me to do is to create keyframes, which are indicated by these blue marks here. If I show everything, here you go. Don't worry about all these lines. But these blue indicators here, one, two, three, four, these are my keyframes. And these are also shown on this column here. Here's my second keyframe, my third keyframe, again in blue, and my last keyframe down here corresponds with this one here. Now in this main pane here, you can see all of the parameters and settings of each one of the images that make up this time lapse. Now with LR Time Lapse Pro, what this enables you to do as I mentioned, is to create these keyframes which are then recognized when you take the sequence through to Adobe Lightroom. Now with Adobe Lightroom, you import the whole sequence as individual files as they were shot on your camera. And each of the keyframes are indicated here with four stars. Now to make your editing a lot easier, down here in the right hand side, there is a filter where you can select just the keyframes. And here are my four keyframes here. One, two, three, four. Now, as you can see, I've already edited these, but I'm just gonna run through the way of doing that here. You select your first keyframe, you edit it how you like, you crop it, you change all of the aesthetics, and then you go back to library. Now, except for the crop, what you then do is you select all of the images, and up here, you have this 
script to synchronize the settings on each keyframe. And by running that, you then administer the settings that you've just edited on your first keyframe to the remaining three keyframes, so these three here. That gives you then a benchmark beginning on the aesthetic of each keyframe to then go in and edit that. So this now being my second keyframe, I've got all of the settings that I've put in from the first keyframe, so I know this is my benchmark start point. If I need to make any particular changes and adjustments here, this is where I'll do it. Once I've done that and I'm happy, I will then go out to library again. I will select the last two keyframes and I will again run that script. I then choose my third keyframe, go back to develop, and again, my start point here are the settings from the second keyframe. From there, I edit, so on and so forth, back to library, choose my last keyframe, run the script. Once I've done that, I go into develop. I will develop that to get my final look. Now, this is the final look that I'm happy with my edit. There's one thing that that script doesn't control, and that is the crop. So I normally edit everything first and then I'll go back to my first keyframe, go back to develop. I'll open up the crop. This is the crop area that I want. Then this is the crop that I've carried across to the other side. I'm not gonna change this, but if I wanted to, I could adjust it however I wanted it. I'm happy with that. You see, you click out of there. In order to carry the crop across, you come up here to settings, copy settings, and you disable everything apart from process version and calibration which are to do with the lens profiles and the camera profiles and you only leave the crop settings everything else you disable and you only enable the crop aspect from there you copy and you know what I'm going to do I'm going to come out to the library I'm going to come into this one develop settings paste settings and that then is going to transfer my crop and apply it to this image Go to the library, do the same with the third and with the fourth keyframe. Once you've got all of your four keyframes edited, you select all and because you've made changes, you come up here to metadata, save metadata to files. From there, it's gonna administer all of the changes and edits and crops that you've edited into these keyframes and store that in the metadata. What I normally then like to do is to come back to LR Timelapse Pro. Here we are. When I come back to here, what happens is I reload the sequence because I've got to now take into account all of the changes that have been made with regard to the keyframes. And then what I do is I will apply an auto transition between those keyframes. Now an auto transition, what that's gonna do is it's gonna program the incremental changes that are needed for each frame between the keyframes in order for them to adopt the transition between the look that you've edited from one keyframe to the next. Now once you've accomplished that, you save all of the information and then you come down to your visual previews. Now the visual preview is shown here in these graphs. The first run through, the main visual is indicated by this pink line here. Now normally this would be a little bit more jagged than is shown in this image. And the reason why it's a lot smoother is because once I've run that initial visual preview, I've run a visual deflicker. And what that does is it will take out any remaining nuances that may be associated with flicker that were generated due to the changing of the shutter speed and the ISO throughout the shooting of my time-lapse. So what that does, it just irons everything out. It creates this really nice smooth line here. And now you can see, you can run it here you can see that there's no real flickers and horrible light bumps and changes throughout the course of the time lapse and it just allows you to find the point where you're happy with it because you can go back and change that if you need to but if you don't need to do that just save that you then go back to Adobe Lightroom you select everything edit select all and then you export using the LR time-lapse plugin. You can export in 4K to JPEG, or you can go 8-bit TIFFs or even 16-bit TIFFs, but obviously bearing in mind that's going to increase the size of your final file. You then decide where it is you want to store that file that LR time-lapse will then use to create the final video file. 
So you set your directory, you press export, and then once you've exported everything from Lightroom, you'll be finished with Lightroom. You come back into LR Time Lapse Pro, and you will get a little dialog box that will then pop up and ask you how it is you want to save your final video file. And that is a very quick run through of my edit. I'll leave it there. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I've been shooting. Cheers guys, see you soon.